You're listening to Winnipeg's Classic 107. My name is Simon Rusnak. This weekend, the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra welcomes Canadian violinist Blake Pouliot to the Centennial Concert Hall stage. Called one of those special talents that comes along once in a lifetime by the Toronto Star, Pouliot performs the Barber Violin Concerto Saturday night. I'm delighted to say that Blake has joined me ahead of the performance. Hello and welcome to Winnipeg's Classic 107. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, well, thank you so much for doing this. Um, there's a number of things that I definitely want to touch on. And the first being your, your Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra debut. Y you must be so excited. Yes, I'm, I'm actually very excited for many reasons. Um, I've never been to Manitoba before. And oh. as a Canadian citizen, it's very funny. I've been to every single province and territory. I performed in pretty much every single province and territory except Manitoba. Well, what's taking you so long to get here? I guess is the I good don't know, question. man. I, you know, I think I, 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 you know, just timing, placement, and I think you know, I've just I've been in Southern California for a long time, and I've been, uh, you know, kind of holding off on as much bitter cold as I can, but I can't do it anymore. So I'm very excited to be able to come there in December embrace the cold and meet everyone in Manitoba for the first time. Well, we're so looking forward to having you here. As you mentioned, I mean, you've performed with world-class orchestras around North America, in Europe, in, in South America. And and as you say, like a, a Toronto-born musician now based in LA, is there something particularly special about performing back home in Canada? I think the, the best thing about it is just that I find that there's a certain camaraderie between Canadians. You know, there was actually this really fun New Yorker article that I think came back out in maybe 2017 or 18. And basically what it was talking about was this entire element of Canadian uh, artists, which is that, you know, if anyone comes into conversation, whether it's, uh, you know, Celine Dion or Ryan Gosling, uh, Catherine O'Hara, anyone who is kind of now a world icon, anyone who's a Canadian adds on to that, oh, you know, they're Canadian, eh? You know, like that's that's kind of like a universal um, thing within the vernacular of someone who grew up in Canada. And so I think what I enjoy is now that I've been kind of off in the world and, you know, I'm more of a U.S. based artist and everything. It's really exciting for me to come back and share things that I've learned and experienced and kind of come back to my roots and, and interact with other Canadian musicians because there's just this certain element of of connectivity that I really enjoy. Um, so, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm always happy to come back to my home country. I'm very proud of my heritage and I love coming back and sharing it. So let's talk more about that, that Southern side of the border. Um, you've, you've been in LA, uh, you made your way down there to study at the prestigious Colburn Conservatory of Music. You went right out of high school, right? Oh yeah, right out, right out of the gate. And so that would be about 10 years ago or so now. What, what, what makes LA home? Well, yeah, so as of, it's funny you say that because I was just talking about this the other day. As of August 2022, it's 10 years that I'll have lived here. Wow. Which is mind blowing. It, I still feel like I'm 16, which is crazy. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, it's kind of situational. Um, when I got out of, so I was in, you know, like you said, I went right from high school to study at the Colburn Conservatory here um, in, but it's in downtown LA. And, you know, when I moved over here, I think there's, I've explained that there's maybe three cities in the world that I've ever felt this sense of um, almost relief when I get off the plane. Um, and what I've always described that as is some place that I've been like, oh, I could definitely live here. Mm -hmm. um, the three cities have been New York City, uh, Paris, France, and Los Angeles, California. And I think that I just really was entranced by a lot of special things that LA has to offer. I mean, there's something really cool about old Hollywood, the way the geography of Los Angeles. I mean, it's it's a really interesting place to be. You are about an hour away from at any given place in this city from going down to one of the nicest beaches you can to go surf. You can go skiing in the mountains. You can go hiking in the desert. I mean, you're so close to all these really cool things if you're a nature buff. But it's also like there's so much history and there's all this great food. I mean, one of the best things I always hear from some of my Korean friends is that a lot of Koreans will actually say that um, the food, the Korean mm -hmm. food in LA is actually better than some places in Korea. And the reason they say that is just that, you know, number one, um, I think LA has the biggest Korean population outside of Korea in the entire world. And second of all, because of our access to fresh fruits and vegetables and all of this other produce, it makes the food really fresh here. I just, I, there are so many benefits of living in this city and um, 
I've just always found it really entrancing. I've always loved coming back, especially I'm telling you November through, I would say May, when I'm touring and traveling around and I'm in Nebraska and then I'm in Montreal and then I'm in North Dakota to get off a plane and it's going to be 22 degrees Celsius and sunny is not that bad. Yeah, I have a friend who uh, refers to um, what are called the Burr months, you know, September, October, November, December. And I feel like if you go to L.A., there there just is no Burr, right? And uh, I mean, one of the other things that I, I'm sure you're expecting this question, um, and I can't not ask it because it isn't every day that I get to chat with a renowned violinist who has an IMDb page. Uh, you're in L.A. <laughs> you also pursued acting briefly, right? I did, but the funny thing is that if you look at the IMDb, you can see that my credits stop in about 2009. So I did pursue acting, but it was when I was a kid, actually. Yeah. I was um, I was in this phase where I didn't know if I wanted to actually go into acting in the musical theater or if I wanted to pursue violin, but I ended up going the classical route instead. I mean, one of the things that I read you, you also really enjoyed was was doing improv. Um, how has that helped you in your career as a musician? Because I think there could be some parallels there, no? Oh, completely. I mean, yeah, I, I've told people a lot of times that improv is probably one of the most beneficial tools I ever got being a classical violinist. You know, one of the things that people talk about, especially as you get into a much more professional career especially and being an individual mm -hmm. is that you know when you're younger when you're a young artist and i mean like all these prodigies and and kids that you see playing the violin or the piano or any sort of instrument whatever it is um when basically from the time i would say you're seven years old until you're maybe even about 19 or 20 there's this element of that we kind of um in fan, like fantasize about, which is the idea of the prodigy. And I think that what happens is we're so mind blown about excellence of young people, no matter what they do. I mean, that's like, I mean, when we think about the Olympics, when you think of a gymnast, I mean, mm -hmm. you basically, I mean, any gymnast over the age of 27, you're like, this is mind blowing. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. we, we celebrate the idea of doing something ex extraordinary at a young age in almost any sort of field. But what starts to happen is as you get older, that stops becoming as impressive and people start wanting to know the individual. You know, it's it's even something like, you know, one thing that's really popular right now is um, Taylor Swift, you know, released her, she's re-recording all of her old music. And she yeah. just released this song called All Too Well, which is a 10 minute song about one of her breakups, which she had when she was 21 years old. And even in pop music, you know, people, like they stop, they stop wanting to see this young kid, you know, I mean, very few artists can still do what they did tw 10, 20 years ago and still six, like have success on that. You know, you need to have people want to see a trajectory and they want to get to know the individual, no matter what field you're in, whether you're an actor, whether you're a pop musician, whether you're a weightlifter, it doesn't matter. And so I found that as I've gotten older in classical, being able to just get on stage and play the notes is not really part of your job anymore. It's almost, it's just expected. If you're going to be a soloist, you're expected to go up there and play very, very well. But what happens is that people want to actually get to know you as a person. They want to talk to you. They want to see what you want to contribute. What is your arc for your own career and personal growth that th that's going to happen? And so being able to talk to people on the spot interact with donors, interact with patrons, interact with the audience, with young people, with older people. All of that is such an important skill in developing um, a following, an audience, and continuing your success into the future. And having these improv skills to create conversation and connect with individuals has been so helpful and impactful on helping me to grow a following and continue my career, honestly. It's been one of the most beneficial things ever. And what a career it's been. If you're just tuning in, I'm chatting with uh, Blake Pouillot, violinist who performs with the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra uh, this weekend. My name is uh, Simon Rusnak. And uh, Blake, I was just looking at your, uh, your your concert schedule for 2021. And you're coming off a couple of performances of the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto in Sarasota, Florida. And before that, uh, in Omaha, Nebraska, with uh, Joanne Folletta conducting, who actually was just on Classic 107 last week. Small, small world oh it is. God. 
I know, <laughs> right? What what are the chances? Um, right. And then in the new year, there are performances of, of Corn Gold and Prokofiev and Brooke. This is um, the only performance of the Barber Concerto uh, with the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra. Tell us a little bit more about your relationship with, with this piece of music. Yeah, I actually, this is a very new piece for me. I've actually only performed it once before and it was with the Quebec City Symphony and it was in September 2020. It was my first return concerto performance back with orchestra. And this, it's very funny you mentioned because my relationship with this is still very fresh because um, back in 2020, you know, this was still before any vaccination while everything was still very dire. And so in order for me to perform in Quebec, what I had to do, like anyone, was I had to fly back to Canada and then I had to self-isolate for 14 days. Now, by the time I got to Canada for those 14 days, we still did not know if this concert was going to happen and we still did not know what repertoire I was going to play. So by the time I got to Toronto, that's when we narrowed down that I was going to be playing the Barber Concerto. So I basically lived in a room and learned the piece from scratch within those 14 days and then went and recorded it for a live stream. No way. What a yeah. what a story. There's a, a little bit of baggage <laughs> that comes with this piece of music for you in Winnipeg. So obviously you have a little bit more time to live with it. Um, you're not right. sitting in a hotel room 14 days with Samuel Barber. I feel like that that's got to be an experience uh, in and of itself. I mean, it's, I mean, it's an incredible piece of music. It was beautiful. It was really fun. I mean, the hardest thing about it was just the fact that, you know, you basically go from being in this small, like, hotel room for 14 days, jumping into an orchestra and playing it in a hall. That was kind of like a shock. But it was kind of awesome. I mean, honestly, I can tell you that 14 days to spend on one piece, even learning it from scratch, is honestly double the amount of time that I usually have. I mean, I literally just got back, like you said, I was performing, um, I had was performing Tchaikovsky Concerto with Sarasota and with in Omaha, Nebraska. But then I also was just finishing a recital tour. I had a recital in Sarasota and then in Miami and then in Philadelphia. So, I mean, I got home, I think I got home last Wednesday. The, yeah, the day before American Thanksgiving. So I've only actually been home for six days now and so I've been playing the barber since then so I actually have less time now than I did before but at least I've learned it before so it doesn't feel as fresh um but it's an awesome piece of music it's a beautiful concerto um very different than a lot of the other things and so even the fact that I have you know more time this time to kind of let it sink in um it's going to be very exciting to come back to it now um know? I do want to talk a little bit more about that. Like you say, it's a little bit different than some of the other pieces that, that you've been playing. And I mean, it's one of those works that was commissioned by the soap tycoon, the industrialist Samuel Fells for the uh, violinist Iso Poselli, who upon completing the finale wanted it rewritten. He called it not violinistic or, or something like that. So can you give yeah. us your take on this concerto and all, all the fuss around that moto perpetuo finale? You know, it's so funny you say that because the moto perpetuo in my opinion, is the easiest movement. You know, no there's way. the whole controversy. Well, yes, because it's funny, exactly that comment, it's not violinistic. What that was actually referring to was that the original composition and the original score for the Barber Concerto was just two movements, which is the, the first and the second. Mm -hmm. Both are very moderato, they're very lyrical, they're beautiful movements. I mean, the melodies themselves are stunning um, that are in these movements. And I think that it what the difference the very funny thing is that the word that is used to this day is that it wasn't violinistic yeah. and so barber added that third movement but i would kind of fix that a little bit and rearticulate what i would say is that it's not very virtuosic until the third movement the virtuosity comes with this moto perpetuo so of course like you said moto perpetuo means perpetual motion so instead barber decided to just say you know what if it's not hard enough or flashy enough i'm going to throw in this like three and a half minute movement, which is just insane. And so when you first pick up the score, yes, it's very daunting. The third movement is quite stressful and even rehearsing it, you know, I was going over it this morning and yeah, it's stressful when you're kind of trying to go over it. It's like a tongue twister over and over and over. But the truth is that something like perpetual motion that's fast like this is actually quite easy to practice. It's very formulaic. You basically put on the metronome and you build it up um, it's very technical. And because of that, I find it very simple. The first and second movement of the Barber are completely different. They're extremely lyrical. 
they're also played in the center of the, the violin's range. So what that means is that, you know, the violin, we have four strings, the lowest being the G string, the highest being the E string. And what makes, I think, the violin so virtuosic is when is the concept of playing really high up on the on the E string, sometimes low on the G string. And those are the frequencies that also resonate the best out of the instrument. And so the Barber Concerto is written very much in the center of the A and D strings. And that just makes things complicated, even just physically. I mean, the violin doesn't speak as loud or prominent in that range. You have to, you have to add more vibrato, much more sound. And it's these awkward kind of lyrical parts that are actually very difficult to play. And so I find the first movement and the second movement way more difficult stylistically than the third movement. However, um, uh, technically, the third movement is extremely difficult, yes. Well, really excited for you to share that with us here in, in Winnipeg. Um, Blake, I, thank you for taking so much time to chat with me today at Classic 107. I guess one last thing, I'm sure you don't need the reminder, but just in case you do, I, I do want to remind you it's it's winter in, in Winnipeg, so don't forget the winter coat to go with that flashy uh, wardrobe of yours. Uh, you, you might need it. You might need it. Thank you. Yes. I've been I've been warned before about it. I have a, uh, I have a goose down parka that I'm going to whip out and be sure to wear it the entire time that I'm there. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe even on stage. Who knows? You never know. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I mean, I'll just put some sequin on it or something to flash it up a little bit. <laughs> well, no looking problem. forward to looking forward to seeing you here. Thanks so much again for taking the time. Thank you.